Good afternoon, evening, First Baptist Church family and friends. Thank you all so much for watching. We are so glad to be able to come together in this time and be able to have some discussion, have some time of Bible study and worship. Uh, if you haven't been watching, if you're not familiar, I want to take some time to introduce us. My name is Luke. I'm Luke Long. I'm the youth and children's pastor here at First Baptist Church of Walnut Cove. We have Pastor Jim Kahn. He's our lead pastor here at First Baptist Church. And we have Pastor A.J. Reynolds. He leads us in worship. He's our associate pastor. And so we love this time to be able to come together, have some discussion, have some times we've in the past, we've gone through books, we've gone through topics, we've had questions and responded to that. Currently, we are walking through the uh, some aspects of the Easter story, some aspects of uh, covenants and what it means and what Jesus did. And last week, we began talking about, from the book of Jeremiah, began talking about the old covenant, mm -hmm. how that looks at the, the new covenant that Jesus fulfilled. We kind of talked chiefly about the Mosaic covenant, the giving of the law and what that looks like. This week, we are going to be in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 22. And I'm going to ask Pastor AJ to read it in just a second. And we are going to look now the new covenant. We'll look backwards a little bit. This may be one that we split over two weeks of discussion because truly when we get, you I'm sure we'll see that there is, so much that can be talked about. There's such richness when we look at this and all that Jesus has done. So before, AJ, before I ask you to read, Pastor Jim, would you open us in prayer? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Good to see you. And we'll start off our study with prayer. Let's pray. God, thank you for the day that you've given us for a time to be together. We thank you that we can gather by this technology for my brothers that are here, that uh, we have this discussion and who make the technology available to our church. Lord, I just... Pray for our time and uh, that you guide us and lead us and direct us that we are not uh, speaking idly, that we speak words of scripture and words of truth, that we do it to bring and build up our church and to build up your people. So I pray that we'll be faithful to that tonight. We remember those tonight in our church that are sick, that are not uh, able to come to worship now, who are still concerned about this virus, who are at home. We pray for those in our nursing home and assisted livings facilities who are not, because of illness, able to leave their homes. We lift them up to you. Lord, we remember those that have recently come home from the hospital. We pray a special blessing on them that you continue to strengthen their bodies. For those families that grieve in our fellowship, we remember them. Lord, you know many other concerns that aren't spoken here, and we pray for those tonight. And we just ask for your spirit to soothe and to heal where appropriate, to give peace and comfort where it's needed. But Lord, that you work among us. And then I pray for our church that we'll be faithful to the work that you've called us to do, mm -hmm. that we use this opportunity as a springboard to share the great message of the gospel with each other and the people we encounter. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn your... Oh, thank you. Turn your uh, Bible on and scroll down to Luke chapter 22, and we'll begin in verse 14. When the hour came, he reclined at the, at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, this is, this is Jesus, is the he here. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. So they began to argue among themselves uh, mm -hmm. which of them it could be was doing this thing. <laughs> what an amazing text. I, I'm, I'm struck by this every time I read it, mm -hmm. that here our Lord instituted the new covenant that from the very minimum, the people of Israel have been waiting on this, the institution of this covenant since Jeremiah spoke the prophecy that we talked about last week. Uh -huh. And when he instituted it, 
The disciples didn't say very much about the covenant, but began arguing about which one of them could possibly deceive our Lord. And that, that, was, the, that was the thing that piqued their interest. How human is that? Mm -hmm. That you've been presented with the grandest of all, uh, of all actions by God, one of the most gracious things that God could do, and our only response is to argue about who's going to, do, who's going to be the one to betray Jesus. Christ is presenting, here's how the, the problem of sin will finally be resolved. Here's the fulfillment of all this. The, the cries and the, 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 the woes of the saints is going to be resolved here. Well, but is it going to be me? Was me? What a human selfish focus of, well, if not I, Lord, when you just miss all the glory that God is doing through Christ. So maybe there was enough doubt in all of them that they thought that maybe they were the one and they just wanted to get Jesus to clear the air on this thing. Right. In, uh, in verse 20, we see here, he took the cup after supper and said, this is the new covenant established by my blood. Um, we, we call it the Lord's Supper because it was part of the the Last Supper, uh, as we uh, refer to the Passover meal here. But, but we, we as Baptists don't use the term communion. We instead mm -hmm. use the term the Lord's Supper uh, because communion is a result of a Catholic doctrine known as transubstantiation, which means you, you literally have the physical body and blood of, of Jesus in, in what they refer to as the Eucharist, and so they call it communion because they believe they are communing with God in a special way and they are receiving grace from God in a special way. We as Baptists historically view this as a symbolic uh, reference to what Christ has done for us on the cross. Yeah. And so, so we don't use communion because we don't believe that we are communing with God in a special way. We, we view it as simply uh, symbolism. Yeah. I think that's a good point because different churches and especially churches in different denominations will will participate in this new covenant differently. Mm -hmm. That's right. They have different underlying ideas behind it or different practices or traditions. And so I think... Or do it different cycles, maybe yeah. every week, every month, every six months, whatever. And so I think... The, well, and and the, the, the historic Catholic view is that the, the communion is one of seven sacraments mm -hmm. that they observe. We, as Baptists, we view baptism and the Lord's Supper as the only two ordinances that, that Jesus commands us to observe. Mm -hmm. And so we, we view this in very different terms depending yeah. on our theological stripe. And I think the way in which we observe this is a little bit different. And I think when we approach the conversation, we, we try to have some humility and try to have some gentleness. That, But we also want to make sure that we give it the weight that this is something that Jesus is telling us to do yeah. in remembrance of mm -hmm. him. Yeah, we read, we studied last week uh, the passage from Jeremiah 31, which specifically named a new covenant. Mm. Jesus specifically identified this as the new institution of a new covenant. Mm -hmm. So this is it. This is, this is what Jeremiah had prophesied. At least part of what Jeremiah prophesied is coming about. And he did it in the context of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. And uh, notice, notice something um, where he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I supper. So mm -hmm. uh, at least part of that was that every family and close relationship group of people would gather for the Passover. You would gather with the people closest to you on earth. Maybe your family, maybe your closest friends. You know, certainly a teacher would gather his rabbi, the rabbi and his students would come together and they would observe the Passover. So Jesus desired to have this meal with them. Mm -hmm. He knew certainly that this would be the institution. And of course the Passover was the, the Jewish uh, depiction of the Old Testament law and the, the annual observance, we talked a little bit about this last week, the annual observance that a, a need for atonement was, was, was regular and often, yeah. and that the, the blood of a lamb is insufficient mm -hmm. for, an eternal, for an eternal atonement. Right. Uh, that, that, that other symbol is found in Exodus 24. The, the symbol of the old covenant is found in Exodus 24. I encourage you to read that. It's a great passage. But in, in, that, in that passage in Exodus 24... Uh, Moses is, is symbolizing the Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And he takes, he takes half the blood and he pours it on the altar, uh, re re representing the fact that God is saying, God mm -hmm. is giving his word here. Yeah. And, then, and then the people give their word that we will obey everything the Lord has commanded. And Moses takes the blood and sprinkles it over the people in a symbolic way. So that, that Exodus 24 ceremony is a, is a symbol of the old covenant we talked about last week. And, and this, this Lord's Supper is the, is the symbol of the new covenant that we talked from, from Jeremiah 31. Well, I think that, I think even that ties into the, the story of how the angel of death passed over the Israelites when they were right. in slavery by nothing less than the sacrifice of, I think it was a lamb that they had to paint over their door. Put mm -hmm. the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. And so now that, then the old covenant is on the altar, but also sprinkled on you. So now we are covered under that blood of the lamb. And then now in the new covenant, we see it is no longer a household. It's no longer by the, the physical blood of this animal, but it's now by the nothing less than the lamb of God mm -hmm. that you will be covered by. Yeah. We're, we're seeing the culmination of Jesus' work here on earth. Uh, God sent his son uh, the, the end of the world to tabernacle among us. As John would say, he lived among us, he dwelt among us. And, and this would be the real reason that he came. He came to offer himself as the Passover lamb for the sins of people. Well, and, and other other theological stripes may interpret this a bit differently than we do. We, we believe Jesus is speaking in metaphor here. This is my body, yeah. which is given for you. And then in verse 20, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood, which is shed for you. Mm -hmm. And so we know that this is a symbolic representation of the work that Christ accomplished on right. the cross. Again, keep, mind, keep in mind the high cost of sin and of course, the Old Testament Jewish people understood that blood was required to atone for the sin of people or individuals. And mm -hmm. so they did that on a regular basis. And Jesus now is offering himself saying, I am that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I'm it. I am the lamb. That, that's right. And you yeah. don't have to have a lamb next year because I'm gonna, what I'm going to do right. is good once and for Sufficient. all. Sufficient, yeah. yeah. Wow. What, a, what an amazing... Um, what, I, I think, I, and again, I, I mentioned this last week, we, we cannot afford to underestimate the cost of our own sin. Our sin is great. It is great. And, I mean, God, God, who set the standard for holiness and righteousness, also paid the cost of our sin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's an amazing, it, it it's is an amazing, amazing concept and, and one that makes us I think plumb a little bit the depths of God's grace. When the mercy. the work of the work of Jesus on the cross is where both the justice of God mm -hmm. and the grace of God come to a come to a collision. It does. Because yeah. God God cannot not be just mm -hmm. and he cannot be less than gracious. Mm -hmm. And only God can do uh, what was done on the cross of Calvary. It's both grace and mercy where we mercy don't drink the, the punishment that we deserve, mm -hmm. but grace are given the, the reward, the richness, the righteousness that we absolutely do not deserve. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. And so those kind of two sides of the same coin of this is, I mean, and that's why I think sometimes we as pastors and as pastoral staff, we not flippantly, but we very often say the gospel is the most important thing. It's central to everything. This gospel, the story of Jesus, we say that a lot. And I think sometimes we say it without spending the time to dwell on it. it really is so central. It is the cornerstone of our faith. Everything else stems from the fact that Jesus really did come, live a perfect life, and die for us. Well, and we, and at least in our, in our tradition, we tend to tack this on to the end of a worship service. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, okay, we've already heard a sermon. we got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. I don't have time for a chiclet and mm -hmm. a little thing of juice. I mean, let's let's move on. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost it's almost a uh, it's almost an afterthought mm -hmm. to a normal worship service. Which and and we 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 would do well to pause and reflect mm -hmm. yeah. on the significance of observing the Lord's Supper and the 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 awesome the awesome work that this represents. Because for a significant amount of church history, the Lord's Supper was the was the reason to gather. We come and eat and we come for right. 
a lot of folks, and sometimes it was abused, and it became an unhealthier practice that then was reformed, and then that then was changed. But it was, you are not saved unless you're able to consistently come and partake of the right. Lord's the, Supper and Communion. Thus the communion argument mm -hmm. that, that if you don't regularly partake, you will have less of God's grace in your life, mm -hmm. and you, you may be less less of a saint as a result of it. And that's, that's, we don't view that. We view that the Lord's Supper is symbolic. So, so what do you think? Uh, verse 16, look, look at that. For I tell you, I will not eat it again, that is the Passover, uh, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. From now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. That's, that's, a really, that's a really powerful statement there. And again, one of these statements that sometimes we, we gloss over. Well, we, we get, a, we get a, a, a hint. We get a hint of this fulfillment in Revelation. Mm -hmm. In the last book where John, John sees the, the, the new heavens and the new earth come to fruition. And uh, what, what, what excites me is that the next time Christ observes the Passover meal will be with us. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, I can't even believe that. Yeah. I, it's, hard to, it's hard to even wrap your at, mind at around At the that. marriage supper of the Lamb, right. which I think is in Revelation 19. And, mm -hmm. and so we get a, so, so we, we're connected with, every time we take part of the Lord's Supper, we're connected with that time when That's right. we will do it next with Jesus. And we don't, we, we, when we observe the Lord's Supper, we look back Mm -hmm. at what Jesus has done. Mm -hmm. But we also would be remiss if we weren't looking forward to Amen. what we will uh, uh, do with Amen. the Lord. So. I, think, I think we've talked about this on some other Wednesday nights, but it's that now, not yet mm. right, dynamic where we have this promise and we live in light of the promise. There are, there are, I don't necessarily want to say benefits, but there are fruits of that promise that we live in. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We, mm -hmm. we, there are aspects of the promise that we have Currently, but there's also parts of the promise that not yet. Well, we mentioned last week Jeremiah sees the mountain peaks, mm -hmm. and we're in a we're in a two thousand plus year valley mm -hmm. between the first coming of the Messiah and the second coming of the Messiah that the prophets didn't necessarily have the luxury of seeing. Yeah, and so we're we're in this. Jesus has done, but but also Jesus will do, yeah, and we're right. we're living we're living in the in between. Because I think when he says, "I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled," we see Jesus eat the fish and have breakfast when exactly. he's risen from the grave. So I think if if we want to call Jesus a liar, we can take it literally. But that's why I see the spiritual reading where he's saying, "We are doing this together, my me and my bride that I'm going to die for. Mm. We are not going to do this until." the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah. Wow. This will not be done in fullness until we are full and so united. That, that's really, I think, I think as believers, we should always uh, look, look at that and say that maybe for us, uh, this will be the last time we take part of this until we're in heaven with the Lord. Mm. And certainly as we look around our fellowship, we could say there are people here today that may not be here the next time, but will be in the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So. So we celebrate. That is a reason for celebration. It's not a reason for sorrow, sadness. It's a reason for joy yeah. that one day we'll celebrate this in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. One day we get to do this not merely as a symbol. That's right. That's right. But in the fullness of the Lord's Not summer. representing what's been done, but mm -hmm. now in the, in the realization that it's all been done. Absolutely. And complete. So it's a great, it's, it's, a, it's a real reason. It's a vitally important celebration for us as a church. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Incidentally, we're going to take part of this. We're going to do it in our worship service on Palm Sunday. We haven't taken part of the Lord's Supper for a while, so we're going to do that. We haven't, we haven't been able to since the coronavirus hit. That, that's right. But we really look forward to being able to do, do that again. We'll do it safely. We'll be very careful. That's right. Uh, but it'll be, a great, it'll be a great time, not only of reflection yep. about what Christ has done for us and how heavy our sin is, but it's also a time of celebration mm -hmm. for what is to come. It's a great, it's a great gift the Lord's Supper. So Jesus, uh, in verse 19, it said he took bread, gave thanks, and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he is instituting the, the new covenant with this symbol of the new covenant, which is 
a simple bread and wine, which is what they used at the conclusion of the Passover. And they took it around and he, and he said, this body uh, would be his body and this body would be offered up as a sacrifice. So when we take part of the bread and we know that the bread that would be used in this first Passover would be unleavened bread. I don't know that mechanically we have to always use unleavened bread, but I think if you have unleavened bread, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that that bread represents the body of Jesus, which would be sacrificed for us. And is the fruit of the vine fermented or not? That's a different question <laughs> for a different time. Should we use Welch's or should we use real wine? We don't know. By the way, that, among other things, if, if, you, if you have questions about these things, please yeah, let us right. know. We, we would love to interact with you more about that if, if there are things that you would like to discuss maybe, about the maybe specifics. There, maybe all your questions are answered, but I, I would imagine that amongst our group, there's probably a lot of questions about this. And if you, I don't, I don't want to write a, a check that y'all have to cash, but if y'all have questions about who should or shouldn't take the Lord's Supper, how it's connected to the ordinance of baptism and church membership, Please reach out to me. I would love to have those conversations with you about anything. But those are not primary issues. Even, even the three of us aren't in 100% agreement on the specifics of all of those things. Yeah. But we would, we would love to talk about those nitty-gritty details anytime with you. We want to interact with you. But tonight we want to, we want to focus in on what the let institution me, is. Let me say that often I think churches or preachers or people make the error and say that uh, this is my body, which is broken for you. Mm -hmm. And of course, that would be in direct violation of the Psalms, which said that no bones of Christ would ever be broken. Old Testament side. prophecy. That's right. That's correct. So, so we would say here that his body is given f for you. So mm -hmm. it was given as a sacrifice. And I think that distinction is important and worthy of just highlighting. It's, it's, it's worth highlighting because of because of what happened on the cross physically. Yes. Yes. And it's also worth highlighting because of Old Testament prophecy. That's right. mm -hmm. And so I certainly think the language of broken is, it, it emphasizes the cost of what Jesus is about to do, but the idea of given being that, in line of that cost, Jesus is gonna do it anyway. Mm -hmm. It right. is being given, it's not being forced. Jesus isn't- Good point. Uh, Jesus isn't beholden to this and being forced into this. He, he is willingly going. That's right. And we see, we'll, I great. think we'll look later in the Garden of Gethsemane, we'll see the, the stress of this. We'll see the, that Jesus recognized, he's not naive. He's not, uh, is not unaware of what it's about to do. And mm -hmm. Lord, if possible, let this cup pass for me, but thy will be done, not mine. So willingly mm -hmm. gives of his body. So, so we would say, I think we would all agree that, that the bread then would symbolize the sacrifice of Christ on the cross in the giving of his body, the mechanism by why we do it, we are passed out the element of the bread or we come and receive it or whatever is, is really a, a matter for the church to decide and mm -hmm. how they do it amongst their fellowship. Mm -hmm. But the thing that we remember is that this, that Jesus is telling, he held up a piece of bread and said, this, this bread is representing the sacrifice that I'm gonna make on your behalf. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what we remember. That's what we- And, and, in, saying, and in saying that, he says, this is, this is the cost of your sin. That's right, that's exactly right. My death is the cost of your sin. Yeah. And, and don't, don't overlook that. And, and to do this in remembrance, the idea that we remember him, mm -hmm. remember this by doing this. So I think it, is, it makes it essential for us yeah. because oh, we absolutely. wanna remember that. And then he tells us in verse 20, in the same way he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant. There we go. He used the word of Jeremiah. There is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So this, this blood would be poured out. If you poured out blood, if I, if I scrape my knee, it doesn't pour out. When blood pours out, it usually does at the cost of a life. You don't mm -hmm. see blood pouring out unless someone is dead usually. So... So this is, this is a, a, a life sacrifice. This is a new covenant poured out for you. And, and so Jesus is establishing that. Let's, let's talk about the cup in just a minute. What, that, what, what does that mean to you guys? Well, I, I, I can't talk about blood in, the, in Scripture without thinking of atonement. Hmm. And just like Exodus 24 represents the old covenant, we see time and time again that sacrifice must be made for our sin to be dealt with once Absolutely. and for all. 
I think it's just, it's, if God is holy and perfect, then when things don't measure up to him, that, that, that chasm between perfection and imperfection has to be crossed. It has to be dealt with. It, if God were to be just flipping and say, oh, it's not a big, then he wouldn't be God. Then he wouldn't be holy and he wouldn't be perfect. And so I think the, 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 the understandable lament of people who don't understand God or maybe who don't believe saying, well, God just sounds so mean. Why can't he just forgive everything? Well, God, do, God has the capacity to forgive all things, but that, that disobedience, that sinfulness, that imperfection, it, it's a cost. Mm -hmm. It has to be dealt with and it has to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so we see this cup and we see, I, I've heard of some people say it's the cup of wrath or the cup of judgment that's poured out. I don't know, but it, to me it's just, it's the, it's the aspect that, and I love how you said, AJ, the, the bread saying, look at what my death has cost, or, or your sin cost me death. Like the cost of this is death. Well, the blood is, the price is Christ's life. Mm -hmm. The fact that he comes, pours out his blood for us. And in doing so then, to me, covers that distance between, he gives away that sin is going to be dealt with yeah. and life is going to be delivered. One of, one of my favorite bloody verses is in uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus the Son cleanses us from all sin. Amen. There's a washing away of our sin as a direct result of his bloodshed. Yeah. And, and it's, it strikes me in this passage, and for a long time I wondered, well, what, and Jesus, in the same breath, apparently, in, I mean, he said, this is the cup, cup, which is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you, but look, the hand of one betraying me is at hand. So here, here Christ, in the at point of maximum grace and mercy of God's action toward humankind, even then, there is in their midst sin at work. And, and we can't, I mean, it's, it's similar when Moses went up and received the law, the people of Israel were down mm -hmm. below sinning. When God talked about holiness and righteousness and, and obeying God, the people were breaking the law. So here Jesus is instituting the covenant, even in light of man's sinfulness. And, and so he still does that. He didn't say, okay, well, all that's off now. I'm, I'm, I'm done with you people. Mm -hmm. and, and God had every reason to be done with us, yeah. but he instituted the covenant even when people were plotting to have him arrested and killed. Mm. So God loves us dearly, deeply, unreservedly, and we should be daily, constantly thankful for that. Mm -hmm. we, we, would, we would be neglectful in a discussion of the Lord's Supper if we didn't at least mention Paul's writing uh, to the Corinthians. Yeah. In verse 11, among, among a laundry list of instructions for good, good order in the church, mm -hmm. uh, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the Lord's Supper also. Um, and so Paul gives some pretty, pretty good instructions to the church. It should be done together. It should be done regularly. Um, it should be, and verses 27 and following say it should be done within the context of self-examination. Right. Mm -hmm. There should be repentance involved in the Lord's Supper. Um, he says, in the same way, well, he says, For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, mm -hmm. said, This is my body, which is for you. Do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so Paul, Paul gives a really good explanation of, of how the Lord's Supper should be conducted and in what context it should be conducted and that we should do it until the Lord comes. And we don't often read this text and Paul's instructions. So next week we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11 in a little detail. So you got, have an opportunity now to go and read that passage that AJ just introduced for us. And next week we'll, we'll dive into that. We wanted you to see... This great passage, simple, mm. fundamental to who we are as Christians, absolutely critical that we understand not just what happened, but why it happened and, and the background. And mm. uh, so, so I hope we've done some of that for you today. So that's, that's some homework. Go and look at that passage in 1 Corinthians. That's where our conversation will be next week. We are going to look at kind of the new covenant from another angle, keep continuing to talk about the Lord's Supper and look at the Easter story. And we are so 
thankful for y'all for tuning in, for watching with us, and we have certainly enjoyed this time to be able to look through it, and we will see y'all again real soon. Thank y'all, church. Thanks.